In Moscow over the past decade, the Tsar's gilded churches and monuments to the proletariat have given way to the symbols of modern Russia. Opulent capitalist towers that poke through the clouds. At the heart of this is where I met Dmitry Grishin. Hello, Dmitry. He's the co-founder of Mailru Group and one of only a few people east of Helsinki who can drive me to the office in his own Tesla. I organized the drive for all my employees, like, like 3,000 people, because we, they want to all to test how accelerate. Dmitry sits atop a Russian tech empire and runs an investment fund for robotics with its roots in Silicon Valley. That doesn't make you want to move there? You have so much going on here. Maybe one day. Never say never, right? Overall, then, do you consider the Russian tech scene competitive? Yes, and, and you know, it's interesting thing that it's very few countries where local players are very strong. And comparing, for example, with China, this internet is fully closed. We have Facebook, Instagram, all kind of uh, Western players, and still uh, pretty successful. So I think we have pretty, pretty, pretty tough uh, competition. Why are Russian engineers so good? I think it's type of education. In Russia, still like mathematics and anything around engineering, they give you very broad, broad view. So if you want to be very creative in, in technology, this is, uh, I think, very good education. This, this, this is the guy, this is the office, yeah. Charging station here. Okay, so everybody knows when you're in the office. Yeah. <laughs> Dimitri's tried to copy Silicon Valley culture here in Moscow, where Mailru Group operates two instant messaging networks, a search engine, a price comparison website, and a ton of online games. They also control the three largest Russian social networking sites. The biggest one is VK, a Facebook knockoff. Dimitri and Mailru Group took over VK in 2014 after its founder, Pavel Durov, refused to reveal information about Ukrainian activists to the Kremlin. Durov lost his company and now lives in self-imposed exile. Dmitry is also one of the world's biggest investors in robotics. He put $100 million into American firms that produced some familiar faces. What's been the biggest hit of all your robotics companies so uh, far? I like all my, my investments, <laughs> I can say. Definitely, I like BB-8 a lot. Also, zip line for the drones, long-range delivery, and now they start to do blood delivery in Rwanda. Dmitry ships all kinds of nerd gear to Moscow to try it out and see if he wants to invest. What's the point of the game? We, we should kill robots. <laughs> so good for you. <laughs> As someone who puts all this yeah, money into robots, are you? Wow, upset? it's it's really cool. <laughs> to get a taste of the high life of a tech oligarch, <laughs> Dimitri and I headed for a bite to eat at the tallest restaurant in Europe, 354 meters above the Moscow traffic. Tell me a little bit about your family history. So, so, so uh, yeah, I, I have pretty, pretty much engin engineering family, and uh, I, I was born in a city called Kapustin Yar 1. Kapustin Yar was the Soviet Union's answer to Area 51, a top secret city where rocket scientists like Dmitry's grandfather tested ballistic missiles and rockets during the space race. Dmitry grew up programming on computers that plugged into Soviet TVs. But things really took off when he enrolled at Moscow State Technical University in 1995. And the same year, uh, Microsoft announced Windows 95. This famous song from Rolling Stone, Start Me Up. Next two years, I tried to write my own Windows. It's so expensive, Windows. Maybe you can just Make write a cheap. cheap, cheap version. So I'm uh, sitting, uh, writing it, but after some time, uh, I, I say, oh, okay, no. It's too hard. He might have failed to rewrite the world's most popular operating system, but he 
He did stumble on the copycat business model that became Mailru Group. And at the height of the 2001 tech crash, he had to find a way to keep the new company alive with no cash. I became like CEO of the company. And my idea was like, let's try to survive no matter how. We tried to do a lot of tricks. For example, by coming with my car, it was a Lada, Russian, Russian car. We put several servers, like physically, <laughs> and, and moved them to more cheaper data center. It's hard to imagine now, but in 2004, only 9% of Russians had internet access. What was the Russian government's assessment of the technology industry? They didn't know that they exist. That all changed in 2012. Russia had become the biggest internet market in Europe. Some people used the web to complain about Putin and organize protests against his re-election. The Kremlin responded in full Orwellian glory with a series of laws that allows them to flag opposition sites as extremist and blacklist them. Ever since, it's been hard to tell where the Vlad web begins and ends. I think in the US, the idea is that the Russian government and the tech companies are just intertwined, and that if the government wants to read people's emails, whatever they want to do, they're going to let them do that. If you follow the law, you're OK. Definitely, the laws became more complicated, right? And sometimes, it's definitely the way how to interpret the law. If you have right now laws that government can shut down any service which is uh, not hosting the service inside of the Russia, they can. This is law. Definitely, you can have big discussion as this law is good or bad, but this is the only way how to you can operate. Those new laws passed this year would make Edward Snowden weep into his borscht. They demand all sites Russians can access move their servers here, including the Googles and Facebooks of the world. Once on Russian soil, they have to store six months' worth of data about people's every move online and then give the Kremlin access. Russian companies like Mail.ru protested. They said these measures would take a ridiculous amount of storage space, but they obviously lost. American companies have said there's no way they're moving to Russia. So now they're criminal enterprises here. And that's how you build a sovereign internet. When we grow our business, our concept was that internet was a global system, no border at all. User everywhere can connect to everywhere. Data can be migrated, everything. So it really was a global phenomenon. But now I think that fundamental global shift everywhere, that you have country, you have borders, and inside these borders, you have different kind of rules, how data is moving, how connectivity is moving, who can connect to what, who can do what. So ex we're not having like global internet. We're having some kind of some global internet, but uh, a lot of like local internets. And for me, this is big set uh, in, in, in terms of change. Just a couple of weeks after we visited Dimitri, he stepped down as CEO of Mailru. The government-approved CEO of VK is taking his place. The new guy also happens to be the son of the head of Russia's largest state-run television channel.